Hello there and welcome to our notes on research and correlation. So we've been talking a little bit about how uh, psychologists um, use the scientific method in uh, real life situations. And now we're going to talk about a couple different types of research that they use, psychologists use, and uh, what a correlation is. So looking at um, the relationships between uh, behavior and people. Okay, so um, their description is, remember going back to psychologists are just trying to describe behaviors and how they connect to the mind. Um, but again, they're looking for correlations between uh, different situations. So I want you to go, actually go back, let's go back to correlation. Uh, correlation, I want you to look at how correlation has the word relation in it. Okay, so we're looking at the relationships between um, whatever the researcher is looking at. So the relationships between behavior, um, relationships between um, situations. So when this happened, does this happen? All right, so we're going to have a little bit of math associated with correlation because we're going to be looking at something called uh, the correlation efficient, okay? I'm sorry, the coefficient of correlation. Okay, so the coefficient of correlation, it's a number uh, that indicates how closely two things are related. Okay, going back to correlation, correlation, relationship. So looking at if two things are related. So later we're going to look at uh, self-esteem and depression. So um, how often is someone who's depressed have low self-esteem? How often are those two things uh, correlated or found together? Okay, so there's two different ways that we can look at correlation. They can either be positively correlated or negatively correlated. Now I want you to take uh, all the thoughts that you have about what positive and negative are and get rid of them. Okay, because when we're talking about the coefficient of correlation, a positive correlation means that when two variables go in the same direction, okay, so they could both go up or they could both go down. I know that looks silly, but you guys hopefully remember this. So if I have a positive correlation, they're both going up or they're both going down. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing. It doesn't mean that they're both going up, it just means that they're moving in the same direction. So then the opposite, a negative correlation would be when two variables move in the opposite directions, okay? So as one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. So a good example of this is like a positive correlation. As I study more, my grade goes up, okay? So that'd be a positive correlation because you could say the opposite. As I study less, my grade goes down. See how they're both moving in the same direction? So a negative correlation would be, um, as I watch TV, that's increasing, my grade goes down. So that's a negative correlation between the two, okay? The two variables move in an opposite direction. All right, so let's look at what that looks like on a graph. All right, we look at um, correlation on things called scatter plots. So I don't know what type of math that you've taken, but a scatter plot, let me actually skip to it so you can see, is this here in the middle. Okay, so here's a scatter plot. It's where we're looking at the two different variables. I have my x and y axis, and it is plotted um, around in, in different uh, areas, right? So we use this, a dot. And then so a scatter plot is a cluster of dots. Um, I'm looking at two variables. So again, like I might be looking at um, my hours studied and my grades. Okay, so how long I study and my grades. And then what we're doing to look for correlations, we're looking at the slope. Ah, oh, scary math. So the slope is, is the... Um, right, how, how steep the line is, okay? So the slope of the point suggests this, the direction of the relationship, okay? And then the amount of scatter is going to be correlated with the strength, okay? So if I have a lot of different scatter, that means that I had a lot of data. Um, and if I don't have a lot, that means that I might have a, um, uh, what I wanna say, little scatter, so it's all along the line, that means that there's a high correlation. Okay, so let's, let's look at some examples, and we'll look at some examples in class. Okay, so you might want to pause it here and just look at these graphs and kind of go back to your other um, slide and go back and forth. So let's look at this one uh, right here. So this is a perfect, so our correlation coefficient goes from 1 to negative 1. This is a perfect positive correlation, right? So as I go up this way, I go up this way at a 1 to 1 ratio. So you have your slope of 1. Okay, this one right here would have no relationship because I can't draw a line through it. I can't find the slope of those points. Going back here, very little scatter here, right? It is right along the line. This is a perfect negative correlation. So as one thing increases, this 
decreases. Okay, so going back here, if I put my, um, my uh, uh, time watching TV, what's happening to my grade? It's going down. So that's a perfect negative correlation because as one thing increases, the other thing decreases versus my perfect positive correlation as one thing goes up, the other one goes up. Here's the definition of a scatter plot again if you want to reread that and pause the screen. Okay, so what that looks like in a number. All right, you won't have to calculate the coefficient of correlation, but you will have to know what it means. So if you're given a number on a test, you need to know what does that positive mean, what does the negative mean, and then the strength of the number. So let's take this step by step. All right, first of all, here's a correlation coefficient. So it says R equals negative 0.37. This is my statistical measurement of how um, much two things are related, okay, or correlated. So R is the, the value, that's my correlation coefficient. Here's what we were just talking about, the negative or the positive. So in this case, the, the positive is going to indicate the direction of the relationship. It's a positive relationship. That means as one thing increases, the other thing increases. Okay, so this 0.37, that's going to look at the strength of the relationship. Remember we said that one is the highest correlation, which means if this happens, this will happen. No doubt, all right? As we go from one down to zero, that uh, correlation gets weaker, okay? And then as we go to the, the, the other direction we're looking at, as it gets closer to one, it's getting uh, morally, that's not a word, it gets more correlated, okay? Write down any questions you have about this. We'll talk about it in class, and again, we'll be looking at examples. All right, let's put some examples to this right here. So this is looking at a correlation. Here, I'll go skip to the graph instead of the numbers. But I'm looking at the correlation between height and temperament. So this is looking at a study done in men, meaning that the, the taller you are, um, your temperament score, how, how angry you get so easily. Okay, so here's a, a scatter plot. So I've got um, different things scattered. So you're looking at height, how tall a man was, and then a temperament score. It doesn't mean probably too much to you right now. Can I draw a line through this? Yes. I can't. So if I took my um, a pencil and I went across the screen, I could draw a line and it goes up this way. So my line is going up, all right? So as I get higher, the temperament gets, I'm sorry, as a as person gets taller, the temperament increases. So what type of correlation is that? It would be a positive, all right? Because as height increases, temperament increases. All right. Now, if all these dots were a lot closer to the line, then we would say that there's little scatter and it's a higher correlation. Now, here's the big idea between correlation um, or the point I want to get. All right. Let's look at, again, I talked earlier about self-esteem and depression. I'm going to say this again a couple times in class, but what I need you to know that correlation does not equal causation. It's the next slide. So big idea. Correlation does not equal causation. So just because two things are correlated does not mean that they cause each other. All right, here's the example. So we're looking at um, self-esteem and depression. So self-esteem, I have people at my door right now. So self-esteem, so here we're looking in this column right here. So what this is saying is that low self-esteem could cause depression or it could be the other way around. Depression could cause low self-esteem. So they might be positively correlated. If I have low self-esteem, I'm sorry, if I have low self-esteem, um, then I would have low depression. So that would be an, a positive correlation. If I go down in self-esteem, my depression goes up. That'd be a negative correlation. Okay, so see how you don't really know the, the correlation and the causation. So does one thing cause each other? Miss Layton is walking in, so I'm going to pause this video. Okay, sorry, I don't remember where we left off. Um, this, okay, so we're talking about correlation and causation. So does depression cause low self-esteem or does low self-esteem cause depression? Or this third possibility, was there possibly a distressing event or biological predisposition, so you have less neurotransmitters, that causes low self-esteem and depression? All right, so just because the two are correlated does not mean that they necessarily cause each other. Okay, so let's look at the uh, three different ways that you uh, or researchers use to study um, to study people. Um, I want you to focus on two things while we're looking at these. I want you to focus on um, what's good about it and then what's bad about it. Okay, so what are why would someone use this type of research versus um, and what are the drawbacks of it? So the first research we're going to look at is a case study. 
Okay, so I recommend you just pause these things and take some notes to the side. So a case study is where psychologists study one or more individuals, not in a group, but just a couple. So it's very small if there's more than one, um, in depth, in great depth. So a lot of these times case studies are like longitudinal studies, right? They're looking at them over time in hopes that revealing these, these amazing um, uh, ideas or uh, that are true of us all. So I'm looking at one person, I'm studying them in depth to see that possibly uh, this one person with schizophrenia, even though I'm not uh, researching a lot of people, maybe what's true of them is true of many people. Okay, so that's my, my positive thing of a case study. Um, I get this huge background of a person and it's over a long period of time. It's very useful in something new. So we do this a lot with um, clinical trials. So I have this or um, anything with um, uh, neuropsychology, so we're talking about the brain, like really weird um, brain injuries that happen. I can't study a huge amount of people that have a piece of their brain missing because most of those people die. But let's say that someone lost a portion of their brain and they lived, um, the, a, a case study we've done in that person. So a lot of information about one person, um, but it has its drawbacks too. So here's a couple drawbacks or the disadvantages. So we're assuming that information can be generalized to everyone and that's not always true all right so people are different case to case even though there are some generalizations we can make a lot of the times we can't take a one specific person case study and apply it to a lot of people and then you have this um we talked about it earlier with bias you have um a researcher's bias so if i am researching something that i think is really important uh, you tend to find evidence to back that up okay um People don't do this again on purpose, but it's done nonetheless. Um, if I'm looking for money to do more research on Alzheimer's disease, I'm gonna be really interested in finding evidence that there should be more research on Alzheimer's, okay? Uh, so that's one type of study, case studies. Look at the disadvantages and the advantages. The other one is a survey method. You're probably pretty familiar with the survey method. You take surveys all the time. So this is kind of this mass general survey that goes out. It's a technique used to ascertain or to collect um, self-reported information um, from a mass amount of people. Um, we're often looking for how people feel their attitudes and opinions. So make sure you know that. That a survey, you're looking for feelings, attitudes, and opinions. Um, and that's usually done by a questionnaire and by a random sampling of people. We'll talk about sampling in a second. So here are some things that could go wrong with surveys. Uh, first of all, how valid a survey is. So um, there's a lot of research done on how you word questions and what people will say. So um, if there's wording effects, um, steering people to certain conclusions, that is a drawback of the survey method. Um, looking at the validity with the sample sizes. Um, so, but a good thing about it is I have the survey that's going on a massive amount of people and I get a lot of information I can gather very quickly. Okay, so I want to know how the school is feeling about the new lunch program. I can give a survey out to everyone and get that information back pretty quickly and get a good idea of who is a, what the feelings are. Disadvantages, it's often difficult to interpret. Um, so I get back a bunch of data, but maybe the, if I says like uh, all the kids don't like uh, the new pizza, right? Was well, it they don't like pizza or they don't like the pepperoni pizza that's being served? So it'll tell me that they don't like the pizza but not the specifics about it. Um, another thing is samples might not be representative. So if I was doing that same survey and I went and gave it to a class of only seniors, I'm not really representing the entire uh, campus, all right? So you have to look at your sampling size. Here's some more disadvantages of surveys. Willingness to participate. People that are willing to tell you their feelings might be different from someone who's not. Uh, false consensus effect, meaning that we tend to overestimate what people are um, honest about. Um, if I get a survey sometimes, or a person gets a survey, sometimes they answer how they think they should answer, not necessarily how they feel. Okay, so um, the question says, how annoying do you find children? Most people say, I don't want to say I find children annoying. I'm going to rate myself, you know, low. Even though in reality, maybe they really don't like small children, but they don't want people to think that. So they answer how they think they should, okay? The last thing is population. So all the cases in the group, um, it, might not, it might not be easy to draw a conclusion from that specific study. Okay, so talking again about the disadvantages of surveys, one of them is looking at your population of people that you give the survey to. So let's talk about three different ways, um, or three different vocab terms, samples and sampling. Um, so a sample is a selected segment of the population. So if I want to um, sample the people in Antelope, or I'm sorry, survey the people in Antelope, I wouldn't necessarily have to give a 
um, a survey to every single person, I could I could pick a, um, a sample of them or a segment of the population to survey and then just uh, generalize those results to the entire community. Um, so that's what's called a representative sample. So it closely parallels the population on relevant characteristics. So what that means is if I have, um, again, surveying antelope, and uh, half the population is um, males and half the population is females in antelope, if I was to select a random sample, a representative sample, then half of my participants would have to be female and half would have to be male. Um, that's so I'm representing people equally, okay? Versus a random selection, that's where every member of the larger group has an equal chance of being selected by the study sample. So I'm randomly selecting people um, to be part of my survey um, on, on equal chances. So if I'm giving out a survey in front of uh, Rayleigh's, that might be considered a random selection, but what about people that never go to the grocery store? Um, that, those people, oh great, the lights just went off. Those people do not have an equal chance of being part of that survey. Let me fix the lights. Lights fixed, all right. So the example of that is called the marbles in a jar phenomenon. So if I have this entire huge jar um, full of marbles and you can, um, uh, assume that like they're kind of like randomly shaken up that if I took a small jar or small sample I could say that um, I would have the same represent representation of that small sample as I do as a large sample okay so the fastest way to know my ratio of the the um, marbles in that jar is just take a small, small sample and estimate okay so let's go on to a couple more so that's a survey method now let's talk about a naturalistic observation so naturalistic observation is where I record um, observations in nature without trying to manipulate or control the situation so in contrast to a case study where the person knows they are being um, observed a naturalistic observation um, I'm not trying to manipulate anything I'm just I'm just observing okay um, so the disadvantages of that my researcher cannot interact with the subject um, so so that's a bad thing also like um, they might interpret things wrong so if I'm just sitting there recording observations um, and someone says something uh, the researcher could interpret it differently than how the person meant it um, and people tend to act differently when they know they're being observed so even though they're not interacting the people know they're being observed remember ethically if you're going to be part of a study you have to know you are in that study but still people might um, uh, act differently so a great example of this is like any type of reality TV even though the person on the camera and is is videotaping them they're not interacting right they're just observing um, but the people on the other side of that camera might be acting different uh, be just because they know they're on camera okay so a quasi experiment this is the very last one so this is another type of experiment or research so a quasi experiment is more scientific but it's where um, it's the studies uh, you can't have a control group so and you can't have a random participants um, so what is saying that again so if quasi experiment is an experiment that's meant to be scientific but I can't randomly select people and and I can't have a control group of, of people that are random so the example of this one um, a common one is like um, drug use during pregnancy so if I'm a researcher and I want to know the effects of drugs on unborn children I can't go out to pregnant women and say, hey, can you guys um, take drugs for uh, six months and then you guys not take drugs? Can I ask a pregnant woman to take drugs? Absolutely not. But I can find people that, that are using drugs, unfortunately, or did use drugs during their pregnancy, and I can do research on them and then compare them with a group of people that didn't. Okay, so I'm not, I don't have the control over dis, um, assigning them a certain group, um, but I am looking at more of a scientific procedure. Okay, so I want you guys to think of examples of class from all these, the quasi-experiment, case studies, naturalistic observations, and be prepared to share them in class.